Uh, this meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person, <clears throat> excuse me, attendance and remote participation in accordance with chapter 107, the acts of 2022, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL C 30 A and 20 until March 30, 2023. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting slash hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the, vi the virtual broadcast unless, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participant participation details noted below. Uh, remote uh, meeting connection below, dial in number, meeting ID, and the URL. I think every time they <clears throat> adapt this, it's longer, isn't it? Yeah. This, <clears throat> this one is quite long. All right, so with a reminder that we want to speak one at a time following our Deerfield Code of Conduct to be respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, non-repetitive, and recognized by the chair. <clears throat> um, board members in attendance, I'll look at Zoom first. So first we have Andrea. Here, present, Andrea Leibson present. <laughs> and Mary. And Mary Cloutier present. Uh, and uh, let's see, Kathy Wittrober. Kathy Wittrober here. And Ka uh, Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Denise Mason. Denise Mason present. And <clears throat> Rachel Blaine is absent. And uh, Annalie Wolfcourt present. Um, and also would like to introduce this evening uh, Amy Hahn, our new administrative assistant. Uh, Amy. Uh, just has joined us, so she really uh, is just observing tonight. But Amy, if you have any um, background or anything you'd like to be able to say to us, um, I know just <laughs> that you know I've, I've been now uh, what is it two weeks now, and um, everything's going great. Alex has been a great teacher, and I'm trying to you know jump in in the middle of a lot of things. Uh, so. You know, I think attending meetings is helpful to try and find out what's going on. Great. Well, we're extremely glad to have you. So thank you so much, Amy. Um, let's see. Uh, minutes. We don't have minutes from our July 11th meeting yet. Um, and as uh, some of you may have seen in a last minute email around, um, Rachel could not come this evening. And so we do need to have someone who can assist with minutes tonight and then also Rachel had mentioned that September is one of her three months of the year that she's really slammed so we will be asking for some minutes assistance in September um, you know, Rachel has mentioned that she can look she's mentioned in the past that she can look at the recordings and work with minutes from there but um, is there anyone who might want to be a back up for her or I'm looking at Ann Mary is I'll do it for tonight absolutely oh, Mary. thank you no, no worries that's great thank you so much and then um we'll maybe figure out what's happening with September I think I already volunteered oh for September in a prior meeting yes. excellent oh excellent Kathy okay ah takes the village doesn't it all right, so first on our agenda this evening, then, is um, Treehouse, and we do see our Treehouse representatives here. Um, as an introduction, um, the 3A plans as submitted to the CONSCOM weren't actually part of our phase two that we approved in our previous site plan review. Um, the extension of the walking trail and construction of the new bridge are new, so we have asked uh, <clears throat> representatives from Treehouse to come this evening and um, address this with us. Um, we'll be evaluating this new work and then memorializing our discussion uh, as 
an addendum to our phase two decision conditions, site plan approval, so that it's um, recognized there. Um, <clears throat> we also will be asking that if there are any future projects that will alter the existing site, if you can come back to us uh, prior to construction <laughs> at um, one of our regular scheduled meetings. Uh, I also want to introduce or reintroduce to some people, um, <clears throat> Ken Comia, who is our planner that's working with us from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, I've requested that Ken attend our meeting. Hi, Ken, nice to see you. Hello. <laughs> see you, literally. Um, and be part of our discussions and deliberations. So thank you, Ken. So um, yes, please, Treehouse, go at it. <laughs> thank you. I'll start. My name is Anthony Wenseski. I work for SVE Associates. Hi, Anthony. I'm sorry. I need you to spell your last name. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. It's W-O-N-S-E-S-K-I. And I'm a civil engineer with SVE Associates. And um, Mark Stadnicki is the designer on this phase 3A project. And first of all, I'd like to just apologize if there was some misunderstanding or confusion over this project. Um, and um, really what it was is we knew we had to go to the Conservation Commission because it really falls in their jurisdiction in the resource area of the work that we were doing. Um, it wasn't clear to me that um, the planning board um, really had a concern about this because it and my reading of the code did not trigger or exceed the thresholds for site plan review. So we didn't do it intentionally not to come to the planning board, um, but when we did receive feedback and um, I didn't have discussions with Pop, but um, um, uh, we offered to come and, and just present what we're doing. Essentially this project or portion of, of, of what we call 3A um, is really a recreational component to Treehouse. If you all recall in site visits that we had out there, um, Channing L. Beat had um, constructed some trails, which were an exercising trail that the employees could use. And I'm not sure if the town folk actually went on and, and used it also, but um, um, Treehouse uh, wanted to uh, improve those. I mean, they've been there for quite some time, but also to expand um, the trails um, to give it a, a better experience for the um, for the customers. Um, I don't know if you know Damien. Damien's quite um, sports inclined, athletic bicycles and running and all of that. So he wanted to uh, go ahead and do that. Um, so um, I'll let Mark go ahead and describe what we've what we proposed. And um, and you're right, there was a component with the bridge. If you all remember the. Um, the small wooden bridge, which is very tiny and um, um, really old, we, we really needed to upgrade that. And in doing that, um, we had to, we built in the building a bridge that meets the stream crossing guidelines. Um, and that was all approved by the Conservation Commission and the order has recorded. I believe you have a copy of that for your review. Mm -hmm. Take it away, Mark. Um, so existing conditions before they started construction of the new path, there was approximately 100, well, 1,150 linear feet of trail or walk path on the site. It connected the driveway entrance to the southern building and the connecting hallway. Um, the existing path is approximately six feet wide and it's stone, but portions of it have been overgrown by lack of maintenance. So treehouses will propose to um, reconstruct those paths and expand it further. They propose to expand it across the stream to have a nice little loop and then loop around the um, field that they pay or are going to continue to have pay and connect the entrance drive to the northern parking area to provide of recreation for their guests on site. The proposed trail is going to be six foot wide like the existing and it's also going to be constructed as out of stone. Um, so phase 3A also has, as Tony mentioned, the um, 
Uh -huh. Replacement of the pedestrian crossing that's um, south of the driveway entrance. The existing structure was approximately a foot and a half above grade on both sides and was made out of wood. And we decided to replace that to give a safer access across the stream. And in doing so, as Tony said, that we had to upgrade the structure to meet the Massachusetts Stormont crossing standards. As we were working within Riverfront Resource Area within disturbed existing disturbed area, we had to um, upgrade and and enhance the riverfront. So there's numbers of plantings that we're going to do to enhance that. Um, you probably wouldn't be involved in this, but when we first went through the first project, um, DEP took a look at it. Of course, they look at aerial photographs and they had noticed that there were a bunch of trees and they thought that they were cut down. Well, if you all remember, there was a string of willows mm -hmm. along the stream there and they had fallen over through storms and got diseased and that's so they were cut down. So we told them we were gonna do something like this. And at that time we would um, improve the riverfront. So you'll see a number of different trees and um, shrubs and so forth. And I think one of the other big things that we're doing is if you go back to the original site plan mark that we have, we show that even though the field is, is hay currently um, down on the south end, that when our biologists looked at that, that's wetland area down there, even though, and, and it's no different to the north mm -hmm. where the soccer fields used to be, where the kids used to play soccer. Yeah. That field has now, a portion of that has grown in and is wet mm -hmm. and we can't do anything there. So in this area where their hand to take up um, and um, you know mitigate for us continuing that existing, or continuing that trail through, there's a portion that we're going to um, not allowed to be hayed any longer and left to grow in place. And also we're gonna replicate for that stone trail through this area of the wetland in the middle there. So um, there probably will be some informational component to this, some signage along there that talks about wetlands and things of that. That um, uh, treehouse will be coordinated with the Conservation Commission on that. Um, so we kept the trails the same size, you know, the extension is still a six foot wide stone dust trail and, um, and we are enhancing the riverfront um, as mitigation to um, working in the riverfront area, even though it's been altered and it's continuing, it's a hay field. So, um, and it's lawn on the um, west side of the stream. And that's essentially the, the project. That's why you know, it's, it's mainly just, there's no major grading. We do have a little bit of grading where the bridge, because we want to get the bridge up a little mm -hmm. bit to allow for the larger storm water to get underneath that. Um, but that's the only real grading. It's essentially scooping out uh, the topsoil, getting to subgrade, getting the um, basin, and then having the stone dust put on. So it, water runs off of it just as if we're running off of the field. There are no point source discharges with any of this work. Mm -hmm which are all triggers for, um, you know, intensive stormwater type things. So um, we just, I think they think that this is something that the customers will enjoy. And there might be, I mean, who knows, they could have um, some sort of uh, activities or meets or something, I would think there. I mean, that's, that's more for them, but, but they, they try to do recreational components with their properties. They just bought a golf course. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's really it. And if you have well, questions. and then there's the bridge. Yeah. Anything more about the bridge that you can tell us about the actual construction so, of the new bridge? The bridge is, or the proposed bridge is going to consist of two concrete abutments and a wooden deck, with wooden hill railings. That's going to be six feet wide. They're really into the wood and the metal, as you see inside the thing. So we don't have the specific details. That's not our right. our thing. But um, um, it is um, it, it is founded on concrete abutments. But and that's outside the area of the bank. 
Um, this is 20, what is it, 20 feet long or 20, 22, 20, 20, 20, 22 feet. feet. So we pushed it to get it outside. So if you were to look at the tall grass that's there where they mow right up to, mm -hmm. those abutments are outside of that. So there is that little bit of grading there just because we want to get it up so it's a nice smooth transition um, to be able to walk. And um, if somebody had a cart they could be pushed, you know, they could, they mm -hmm. could do that. Um, so no real specific, it's supposed to be a wooden timber bridge on, on concrete foundations with railings, obviously. Yeah. You mentioned um, that the walking trail, maybe we can address the walking trail first, is six feet wide. The existing trail is 1,500 feet. The new trail is considerably longer, isn't it? Yeah, you can, Mark, you can point out how uh, the trail. The new trail is approximately, would add approximately 4,650 linear feet. Um, uh, it would start in the north, um, yeah, the north corner of the parking lot, travel to the driveway entrance, where it would connect to the existing trail. And then there would be a loop coming off and across the stream to connect the loop. And then there would be a giant loop around the edge of the existing field connecting the existing trail to the area where they have built water parties right now in the um, proposed food truck area. Maybe uh, could you address also, Tony or Mark, the, um, anything in particular with the stream crossing standards report and the stormwater management report that you've submitted? I mean, it, it may seem fairly straightforward. Um. Yeah, the stream crossing, there are, remind me of our company standards, eight, seven or eight standards that we have to meet. Correct, seven. Or of justification why we can't meet them. The biggest one usually that you can't meet is one of economics. Um, but in this case, um, I believe we met all of them, didn't we? We did. Yeah. Um, uh, one standard two, which is that a culvert should be embedded a minimum, minimum of two feet or at least 25% of the round culverts is not applicable, but all of the other standards we meet, um, we increase the openness of the bridge and it's wider than the, it's one and a half times or 1.2 times the bank full width with the opening of the bridge being 20 feet. Um, the stream channel is approximately 14 and a half feet wide. Um, we are, they're not doing construction. They're not really touching the stream um, bottom. So that's gonna be left intact, natural substrate. Uh, standard five is designed with an appropriate bed forms. And as the bottom's staying natural, that standard's met and then we'll, Standard seven is the bank should be present on each side of the stream matching the horizontal profile and the banks on the, there's no proposed changes to the grading of the bank within the. I think um, we might want to have these two reports attached to our uh, notes from today. So um, what I might ask for with that, I don't know if we have any other questions in relation to this report from planning board members, I can. Um, just as a small thing on the existing conditions on page two, I think you're in the second paragraph, you're referring to, pay, to um, phase 3A, not 3B here, right? It's probably a typo. Yeah, just yeah, a, that's just a, a typo. typo. Yeah. And then, um, yes. And then potentially too, as you've done on your stormwater management report, if, if that's something that you could sign also, um, as um, you have signed, or is that? It's signed. Did the copy they have was oh. not signed? Did I not send you a signed copy? Uh, well, I don't know, as I see the stormwater management report, I see um, your signature here with a stamp. Yeah. Um, well, that's yeah. probably an attachment. Oh, yeah, that's oh, they're, yeah, both, they're attached together. Oh, they're both connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're connected. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. All right, cool. Um, any other uh planning board or can have questions about the stream crossing standards report? 
No, not really. How wide is the stream? I mean, I it's like 14, 14 and a half feet. Yeah, the bank's like 14 and a half feet wide. Okay. Yeah, it's not a really high bank. Yeah. You know, if you know the water runs through there, it widens out. Yeah. It's not a right, right. special flood hazard zone, but it is the 500 year flood. It's yeah. zone B um, through there. Um, but uh, so the great thing about this, they have the wherewithal to do it. A lot of times when you get into build, Things you're you're pushing it tight, bringing it right to the um, to the edge. You know, a lot of times you go culverts because they're you know municipalities don't have the money to build a bridge. You know, and right. the thing about this, it's just a pedestrian bridge. It's not a. It's yeah. not. We're not having heavy equipment. It's not for cars or anything to run over. So, um, but it's it'll be built like everything they built. Mm -hmm. It's really strong. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess they could bring a mower over it so then they don't have to go up in the driveway and bring it around mm -hmm. they could do something like that but um, um it, it it we designed it so we wouldn't touch any of the resources like bank land underwater any of the vegetation there they have to replace substrate in the stream because those are all important things now uh, yeah. with the stream crossing so this was pushed out very wide that's why we had to bring some grading in to be mm -hmm. able to to make that transition but it's minimal, the, the amount of grading that we're doing there. As um, I look at the stream crossing standards as, although, you know, they're fairly condensed here, but as I understand them, they really do have to do primarily with the, the stream crossing standards and not necessarily sort of the intent of who's going to be using it, how, you know, so I wonder from the standpoint of are there gonna be bicycles? Is, what are the safety precautions, the lighting? Um, none of the trail is lit for evening use. It'll be for, right? <laughs> they haven't changed that. Treehouse closes at, oh, eight at yeah, eight o'clock and they um, stop serving like a half an hour before that. So <coughs> in the winter time, um, I'm not sure what they plan on doing. I know Damien said during a site visit that the trail may be used year round, but he wasn't sure. It, I don't know if they have like that finalized game plan yet. Of yeah, I mean, if it was lighting, that would trigger something where we, you'd want, you'd probably be interested. It's not at this point. We don't have any provisions for lighting, so it'd be a daytime use mm -hmm. during the during the uh, hours of light during the day. Okay, maybe if that could be included in the um, narrative, I think the narrative will be also probably something that we'll want to attach to okay. our- we can, we can update that um, just because uh, that should be true. I mean, if they go to something and they have pedestrian lighting in through there, I think that, you know, any changes now, we've got a good understanding would come back, any site changes or any of the building stuff would sure, trigger sure, automatic sure, site sure. plan review anyways, that we would come back, even if it's just an informational mm -hmm. um, discussion with the board, so. We can edit that to add information that it's for daylight hours. Yeah, no hours. Lighting. And then also while you're doing that, I mean, <laughs> tomato, tomato, um, minor, major, if you could make note that I think that the new addition to the trail is 4,600 feet because that is a significant increase over the yeah. existing trail. So that would be helpful. Yeah. Have people actually ridden bikes on the trails before? Not that I know of. I mean, no. is, are, they're still sort of loose. It's not like it's hard pack. Is well, it'll, it? be hard. Really it'll be hard. It'll be hard pack. Uh, they'll, well, I, they'll, 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 they'll hard pack it, but it's a stone dust on yeah. top. So it, yeah. you know, the top little bit will be, um, will be loose. Yeah, um, I don't think but, I'd be riding my bike on those trails. No, I don't think, I don't think <laughs> they would. Not my road bike. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I think it's for people to walk. Yeah, it's, I think it's so. walking. I mean, you could, I guess you could jog on it if Hopefully, you wanted yeah. to. But, but I, I don't think it's for bike riding. No, I don't think so. I don't and think I, I think about that with um, also just, you know, now close to 6,000 feet of, of trail with uh, trash recycling. And I don't know if pets are going to be allowed. Are they? And they pet, you, can have, you can have dogs outside. You can yeah. have dogs outside. Oh, no, well, Treehouse is very good about having no. Yeah. Um, clientele pick up after the pets and pick up the trash. I, they're um, very um, nature oriented and keeping nature. They have clean. staff too. They have a they have yeah, a, an abundant right. amount of staff. Um, I don't know their grounds crew. I don't know how they do that, but um, 
um, my experience, but limited experience there, it's it's been kept um, in good shape Jen, even through construction period. Yeah. Uh, Jen, I think we have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, like the pets outside aren't really the purview, right, Ken, right. for site plan review. So just staying on the changes to the the site. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking from a health standpoint. No, but yeah. You know, the select board can do that for the health. It, I guess complaint driven. <laughs> yeah, and it would be. Right. Um, other questions? Nope. Um, yes, Kathy. Just I'm looking for her. Um, on the, I have a quick question. Oh yes, go ahead. Kathy. And you may have stated this, and this I is may Kathy Wittrobo. Kathy Wittrobo, sorry. Um, so the bridge itself is six feet wide. How long is it? The span is twenty feet, um, but there's a foot overhang on each abutment, so the deck itself is twenty-two feet long. Okay. Um, do we have the terms? I look forward to walking over the bridge, sipping a beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in relation to um, the stormwater management report, um, <clears throat> you know, this is back again with sort of subjectivity. <clears throat> Both standard number two and standard number seven talk about. Um, standard number two, keeping stormwater runoff de minimis, does that just mean you hardly see anything? Is there an actual engineering definition for that? Or is there, is it just, there's, there ain't gonna be much sweetheart. <laughs> it's less than one CFS is my, if I recall correctly in the uh, stormwater standards. And, oh, I see. So that's the yeah, that's definition. The oh, great, yeah. okay, cool. But if you think about this, so if we take out six feet of hay field and we put in a six foot stone trail, obviously the, the difference is in that when water hits it, there is difference, right? Mm -hmm. But once it leaves that trail and gets into the grass, I mean, we're not generating more water, it's still hitting. And there's no, like I said, we're not collecting it in a storm drain. We're not channelizing it. It's just running through the grass as it always did. So in our opinion, um, with no point source discharges, anything of that nature, it doesn't rise to the standard. We're actually looking at stormwater in a very comprehensive review to be able to design certain things because um, we're not creating um, treatment problems. We're not any of those, you know, where we have to size pipes or catch basins or any of that. It's like having a, a walk in your backyard, mm -hmm. you know, uh, water's going to hit on it, hit in the grass and it's going to disappear. Just yeah. Go through that way. yeah, it's okay. caught to the level. I mean, there's, um, I haven't been out, Mark's been out to things. I'm actually kind of retired, but <laughs> um, it's, kind it's flush with the grass. So um, we didn't create areas, um, even though you'll see all of our erosion control barriers and everything out there, um, there's little opportunity um, for uh, erosion into the thing. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest concern that we have. It's not the amount of water and how it dissipates because it's gonna dissipate over the lawn in the hay field areas like it always has. So hopefully that kind of, that's understandable. Okay, that makes sense. That's yeah. helped that yeah. the picture is, mm -hmm. is more helpful or as, yeah. <laughs> as helpful as the, the narrative. Um, number seven, you're saying that the redevelopment will comply with standards to the maximum extent possible. Is there anything? Well, standard number seven in the stormwater um, standards, it, re real, it, it re uh, um, relates to redevelopment of a site. So this is a hay field, it's a agricultural, it's um, a lot of things. So when you're, it really goes to, uh, I guess, to more of a commercial or uh, a development where say you take, um, an old mill and you turn it into um, apartments or something like that and you're reworking the parking lot and that they don't hold you to the highest standards as if you were cutting trees down and starting something from scratch 
over natural yes, gas. Yes, right. It looks so, like some are. So there are some, there are some, I mean, you can't carte blanche do whatever you want. There are standards you still have to meet, but because you're tied to an existing um, rehab of some other facility, you have to meet um, only to those as, as best you can. Because mm -hmm. there might be constraints on an existing site that you can't get to the level of standard as if you were starting from new or from raw land. So that's the best way that I can describe and that. And this obviously Yeah, is this is, yeah. The, really, the storm drain with this doesn't do anything. The stream crossing and putting in a pedestrian bridge that meets their standards, but also meets the DEP's requirements um, for uh, openness ratio and leaving the banks and the substrate alone or recreating that if we had to get into it, but we're not. That's the most important thing from a stormwater standpoint for this project. I see. Okay. Bob, do you have any other questions or um, comments? Uh, was that, I, I don't have any questions or comments, no. no. I mean, the bridge, um, I've been receiving all the concrete reports, so it's structurally sound. I'm not worried about that. Really, no comments. Yes, I, it certainly seems that the um, removing that foot to foot and a half step from the old bridge, which was kind of really nice, right? Yeah. 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 Good thing. Safer, definitely. Right. It's, well, yeah. I mean, when Channing Beat was there, people weren't drinking. When Channing Beat was there, people weren't drinking beer. Yeah. So <laughs> if someone's why it's nice not to be tripping onto the bridge. So <laughs> nice smooth transition. Well, I think the best thing is when you get heavy rains down there, that bridge is not going to stay there anyways. They probably picked it up, moved it back. And mm. yeah. you know, um that they're, they're looking for something much more permanent and, and stable. Yeah. So um, I I think this fits the bill in it and also is a huge improvement over that little Pedestrian bridge. Ken, did you have any other thoughts? No, I think um, as the applicant has, um, you know, described the project, and I think to the chair's point with regards to just um, ensuring that any amendments to um, the initial site plan approval, um, you know, just come before the board, even if it is informational. But I think it. I think that the project itself is compliant with with the needs and, and based on the site plan. Perhaps we would state that in our motion and also ask for the attachments of the narrative and the stream crossing and the stormwater management standards reports that we pulled together. So I appreciate that. <clears throat> Um, any other comments or questions from the planning board? I appreciate that you came this evening for sure. Well, thank, thank you. you. It's, it's, it's wonderful working with the board. You guys are great. So, <laughs> so um, my bad on not coming. So, well, Mark, Mark won't make that mistake. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. I, we still need to vote. Yeah. I mean, you want to be here for the vote, right? Okay. <laughs> Although, if we can have a motion, I think the I believe the, the motion would be to, um, well, let's see, help me with this, add as an addendum to the uh, approval of our phase two uh, site plan review that we have examined the phase 3A as presented to the Conservation Commission and to the Planning Board and find that it is in accordance with our prior or approval. Is it actually an addendum to stage two? Right. It's really stage three A. Right. Well, but we don't. It, it, is it or is it is it an amendment? This is, and, this is Andrea talking. Is it an amendment to the site plan review of phase two? Our understanding from some legal counsel is that we could either have this as sort of an attachment to phase two okay. or, you know, try to go through the whole kit and caboodle of the site plan review for phase 3A. We didn't extension? decide to do that. We have an extension an to phase two? Extension, is that an appropriate? Sure. Because we're, we're, we're not changing its origin, we're, ex we're adding. So it's, I, I would use another extension. Extension sounds. Um, yeah, yeah, this is Andrea. Yes. 
when working on the um, fees and schedules that um, we'll be talking about in a, in a minute, planning board fees and regulations, the word amendment was encouraged by Casey. When, we, um, when plans get changed, they are amended. And we wanna probably keep that language um, the same. So I would encourage us to refer to this as an amended plan. Uh, I, can I just, I think that I'm, I'm happy to use whatever language anybody feels is most appropriate, but we're not changing phase two. Exactly. We're ex it's an extension of right. phase two to add these motions of phase three. Well, in my opinion, maybe right. I'm misunderstanding. What I'm also recalling as you speak, Kathy, is that um, the other thing we could, that was suggested we could do is memorialize these in our minutes and then attach the minutes to our previous phase two. So we don't have to call it anything. Okay. Uh, yes, let's do that because yes. it's not an amendment. Okay, so yes. we then would be, Approving a motion to approve the um, these three a the <clears throat> the minutes of this current meeting to reflect our decision for phase three of three the trail three a of the trail construction and bridge work at Treehouse. Right. Good, including that future projects that would alter the existing site be brought back to the planning board. That's your motion? And then also that we have that we have the attachments as discussed. Yes. And we so have the we'll attachments as you discussed. say that. Oh my goodness. I think it was moved by Denise. Denise and seconded yeah. by uh, second by Kathy yeah. Sylvester. Yeah. Sure. Uh, is there any further No, we can discussion? work out the language. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, Andrea? Um, Andrea Liebson, uh, yes. And Mary? Amory Hootier, yes. Denise? Denise Mason, yes. Ka uh, Kathy Sylvester? Kathy Sylvester, yes. And Kathy Wittrobe? Kathy Wittrobe, yes. And Annalie Wolfko, yes. So now you can leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You very Thank much you so for much. coming. And if Treehouse was open, you could go have a beer, but it's closed tonight. <laughs> Sorry to. Right. Well, there are other constituents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. With a name like Wenseski, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome anywhere. Here. Thanks, Thank Andy. You. Thank you, Mark. All right. And so, uh, Andrea, you were just mentioning fees. And um, take it away. Uh, good night, now. I got to go. So. Oh, yes. Bye. Thank you, Bob, very much for coming. Yep. Appreciate okay. it. Bye bye. Thanks. On July 18th, the planning board met to update its handbooks. And we discovered at that time, there was another planning board fee, which had not been included in the document um, that was sent to you all. Looks like this, right? And so we need to add one more fee. And that is the stormwater permit fee. And so it will fall, it will fall into 3.3F stormwater permit. It currently, that dollar amount is $100. Uh, and I need to speak a little more um, closely to Jen to determine if that amount of money seems appropriate for the work that's involved by administration. Um, so the dollar amount isn't set at this point. And uh, that's the only addition that I believe um, will come under the planning board fees and regulations. If anyone has any others that, that they could covered. be our discussion tonight. Um, Casey suggested 150 uh, since often stormwater is combined with site plan review and therefore it wouldn't be up to the 200 or 250 that most of our other permits are. But Jen, your thoughts on this? 
Um, I agree in, um, with Casey with it being at 150 because if we're charging quite a bit of money with something that's, con you know, that's concurrent with another application, it becomes you know, quite expensive for the applicant. And I think that with a combined application, it, it, we're, we're already doing some of the work yep. and increasing it slightly by $50, I think is reasonable. Okay, if, if everyone on the planning board is amenable to that, I will um, add this extra fee into the document and send it along to everyone. I have a question, Denise? Annalie, because I thought on September 12th that we were going to have a public hearing. We don't have a meeting before then. So tonight, if we vote on this and you send it, I mean, even though you don't need to send it to us for approval, we can approve that tonight so we can have that public yeah. hearing on the 12th. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. So we should, yeah, we should do that so that we can have that. So I don't, I don't think we need to have a vote in particular if we all seem to be in agreement with the 150 and that the stormwater regulations as um, we reviewed last week with other adjacent fees is still acceptable and we'd like to go forward with our public hearing on uh, at our September meeting. Correct. And, and Amy, who is here, will be posting the public hearing two weeks in advance and all that good stuff. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> right. Anything else with the fees, Andrea? Like Not that I'm aware. Did anyone find anything else? Um, we, we did a big aha at that July 18th meeting, but that was, I think, the only one. Did I miss anything else? That's good. Okay. So Jen, do we need to do we need to vote or are we? No, we're good because then we'll have the public hearing and then that will um, approve everything as one. Okay. Good. And then Andrew will be going off free of COVID to Treehouse for some beer. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Or Berkshire or one of our other fine breweries. Um, all righty, so let's see. Next on our agenda, um, we have um, periodically been knocking away at various tasks that we wanted to do, one of them being fees, thank you, Andrea, one of them being accessory apartments that Kathy's going to be speaking to in a minute. Um, uh, we did fortunately receive our um, small but very much appreciated appropriation at town meeting. And um, so we are splitting our part-time planning assistance between Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, Ken, and Franklin Regional Council of Governments for COG with Peggy Sloan and her staff um, as we talked I think at the previous meeting with Ken, uh, Ken will primarily be address, uh, assisting us with um, bylaws um, as they come forward and also the app and um, not bylaws, I'm sorry, with applications. I just gave you a, new, a whole new <laughs> responsibility there, Ken. <clears throat> All of our applications with applications as they come forward, working with Jen and with <clears throat> Bob and um, our town staff. Um, and also helping to update some of those actual applications and then helping us with writing decisions and writing conditions. Um, so we sat with Ken on that, but um, as we all recall, we did have a number of priorities that we then discussed with Peggy in general, uh, which she actually says is a good three to four year plan. <laughs> but um, other than having her available to us for um, periodic assistance or bylaws that other entities might be bringing forward to us, um, we can give her some, uh, you know, some priorities and uh, a way to get started. So I did send out to everyone um, the, uh, the sort of the consolidated list as, as we 
have it right now. Certainly right now she is. She is assisting some with um, our accessory apartment bylaws and um, look, looking at our floodplain bylaws. But otherwise, um, yeah, there were a question of um, basically updating some of our uh, our plans, our master plan from 2000, our housing production plan from 2014. And that certainly ties into our need for um, increased affordable housing as we saw from the Department of Community Housing and Development. Um, looking at um, our town bylaws, updating them for inconsistencies, redundancies, unintended consequences, that could be a larger project or a smaller project and I'm not quite sure how that would be. So Jen might be able to address that. Um, looking at strategizing how we might have an approach to quote up zone our town center, um, mixed use development, smart growth, terms that maybe I don't even know that I'm <laughs> saying just like some of that CSI, one inch CS, whatever, um, with, the, <laughs> with the zoning. Um, looking at uh, updating our roles and responsibilities uh, in our planning board and, and actually overall our planning board rules and regulations. And that's sort of a big cipher. Um, we do have a draft of our roles and responsibilities. And I'm not sure that <clears throat> certainly we don't have in our, I mean, to some degree, I don't believe we have, if there are other rules and regulations, um, they're not maybe highlighted in a way that I could understand. Um, and then also looking, strategizing how we could in, increase our housing inventory. Those were things that we had talked with um, Peggy about. And so planning board, what do you think? <clears throat> Kathy Sylvester. Um, I, you know, looking at all of that and working on this ADU bylaw, it just came to my attention that, you know, having someone look over the bylaws that we have and make sure we don't have this, you know, conflicting bylaws. Sure. And discrepancy seems to be paramount because when you're writing a new bylaws for trying to do with ADUs, it gets kind of dicey and then you have things that are, you know, if you cross-reference and there's conflicts. So it would be nice to have to look at that, but I know that's a big ask. Yeah, well, Jen, maybe if you could talk about that some too, because it seems like I have seen or heard maybe two different ends of that. One being um, Peggy did mention if she really was going to be looking comprehensively at our bylaws that that would be potentially a delta grant of you know 50 60 grand and well and i don't really know what i mean and it seems like then all of that is something that then would go to town meeting and go through all the boards and whatnot is there is there another way to sort of begin that project or is that what you were thinking of when you proposed this yeah that's what i was thinking i mean it really it should be a comprehensive look and be it costs a lot of money to do because you really need a you know I would think a, a team or at least somebody to be focused and to really go through the bylaw with a fine tooth comb and really look at I mean even I mean you even today I was talking to Amy because of the emails that you were sending about the way that our online um e-code is set up and we're working with e-code to fix some of the things and, and combine. So even our online um, bylaw isn't very intuitive and comprehensive. And so we're working with e-code to fix that. But I mean, that's on a different level, but really going through each one of our bylaws and making sure that there isn't any inconsistencies. I mean, we found things, um, Bob found things in our bylaw that are just even not even relevant anymore and changing the language and making sure, I mean, Ken could see that I'm sure by glancing a little bit at our bylaw. So um, I really think a, a grant that can be a comprehensive look uh, to help us pay for those changes is what we should be looking at and not sort of piecemealing it. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I think we run into more problems. Uh, what do you think, Ken? Um, I mean, I think what ends up happening oftentimes, and especially if you have the momentum to pass an accessory dwelling unit bylaw, is 
work, use that momentum. The, the cleanup can happen after. Um, and that's always my approach, especially if, if there is that discussion and it's very strong in town. Um, I think with regards to, and I'm doing this process with the town of Pelham at the moment, looking at their zoning bylaw um, through, as you mentioned, Annalie, it's a DLTA grant. Um, I'm assuming that Franklin uh, Furcog also does something similar with their member communities. Um, but typically it's to, you know, go with a fine tooth comb through the zoning bylaw and um, identify conflicts and identify um, words um, that, you know, may be troublesome um, or, and then also working with the planning board um, to see if anything had happened during the past couple of years since they passed these bylaws with regards to any confusion of administering them. That's the important thing. You want to ensure that um, and and to be and to be truthful, they their bylaw is actually written quite well, um, considering the uh, volunteer nature. Um, like Jen said, um, they also have e-code, and there's a lot of mismatch between, what the record of the planning board is and what ECODE has. And so just taking a quick look e -code. At... I don't think we all know what ECODE is. Thank you. So um, do you... ECODE is our um, electronic, the state approves our bylaws and it goes through ECODE and they approve our bylaws and they put it electronically online. Can you say it better than I can? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think typically, and what ends up happening with a lot of smaller towns that don't have e-code is you have a PDF, right, that you amend over time, um, that you just add those items. Um, as Jen said, e-code is the like formalizing, if for lack of a better word, of all of both the general bylaw and the town zoning bylaw. Um, so typically, um, it may lead to new formatting, new numbering, um, and I don't know where the town is with regards to that, but it's, as you can see on the website, on, on you know, when you look at, try to look for uh, Deerfield's um, zoning bylaw, it's a page that show, says zoning bylaws, it has all of your previous amendments over time, and then it has a zoning PDF, which I don't know you know, what is that reflective of? Is that the most up-to-date PDF based on the zoning bylaws amendments that you've just passed in the past couple of years? Or is it like based on, you know, another year? Um, so I think it, you know, it's always, I think it's good to go to ECODE, but there is this weird, you know, timing issue, especially if, uh, you know, the town clerk's involved and has working with all of the previous town meetings and all of the records of bylaw amendments, both town and zoning. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you're on the right track by identifying that you need a comprehensive zoning bylaw review. Um, I think that um, every community, especially looking at the list of amendments that you've passed over time, it probably is worthwhile to, to ensure that you know, um, citations uh, are correct, as well as maybe because of the way your numbering scheme was prior, that you kind of shoehorned an amendment based on the existing numbers. Um, this way, you'll be able to identify that you may want to change your whole numbering system and, um, you know, apply what you already have passed and just put them logically and then create a system for future amendments so that it's a lot easier to follow. Um, so it, it's kind of like, you know, something to reassess, ensure that, you know, your code is compliant with 40A, some of the changes, some of the language, identify things that maybe the planning board may want to look at over time. Um, in Pelham, we were looking at um, one of the things that came up, and it, it also involves somewhat of a community process too. So, um, you know, they don't have, that their master plan is from years ago, but they're also identifying bylaws in time and real time that they want to pass. So this is an opportunity for them to also, you know, use my efforts to help them write a uh, common driveway bylaw, which is one of their requests, or addressing cannabis, which is something that they're also trying to do. Um, so it, it's things like that. But, you know, obviously you work 
with, um, you know, I think as, as Anna Lee had mentioned with talking to Peggy, um, that's something that typically could be funded through a DLTA grant. You also have other types of grants that you can, um, but it is a larger effort and it probably costs a lot more time. It's more time intensive. <coughs> so it's almost as if um, there's a good news, bad news with that. The, the good news is that maybe only just to the extent of writing the grant, it would eat into our planning allocation, but the bad news, if you put it that way, is that it would be a significant project that Let's, you know, might be involved with. Yes, Denise. I have a number of questions. Yeah. So the first thing is, would, is, would the FERCOG be able to write that grant? Okay, that's a just a quick question. Well, they've said they can. But I don't know if they were charges to write to write it. Well, it depends. I mean, I know when we did the Shared Streets and Spaces grant, the FERCOG wrote it, but then there was another, I, of course, I can't remember the name. There was another organization that was um, through a, a foundation actually paid for them, paid FERCOG to write that grant. So that's a possibility that I think that's a question for FERCOG. The second thing is with ECODE, does that mean that all of our zoning bylaws are there on ECODE and okay, so would, and are they all up to date or would, would the FERCOG have to look at the ECODE and then look at PDFs to see if there is a direct correlation between well, the two? So it was very interesting because um, I just got the login to ECODE so that I could see see all of the back ones just recently. I just was like, we were trying to find um, a bylaw and for a particular year. And I'm like, it, if we don't have it in paper form, where does it exist? You know? And so I just sent an email and they gave me a login and I found all of our back bylaws, which is great because now somebody knows where they exist. Um, also, there is a part of the... Um, e code that says new bylaws that haven't been put into what you look at. So up in the upper, when when any average any person in the community goes to bylaw and looks at our bylaw, up in the upper left hand um, box it says new bylaw. So those are all the ones that we sent. We went to town meeting. We were they were approved by the AG's office. They were sent to ECODE, and ECODE uploads it to this site, and that's where you can locate anything that was approved at town meeting, and it's by article. So, doesn't say what it is in the article, but you have to open it and see what it was. Um, if it if it's something that's pending for the AG's office to approve, we had a bunch of mistakes that happened. Um, I know Amy sent me an email and I haven't been able to check it from what you said, Anna Lee, that there was a discrepancy in dates of approval time. So I need to look into that. And that would be a question for the AG's office and for the clerk's office to ask ECODE why that, I have to look and see. I haven't, I didn't, I, yeah, my zillion emails from being on vacation. So I haven't gotten there yet, but. Um, uh, that's where they all live and they get updated. And what Ken was saying is about the PDF. See, the other thing is, is that if we had it in a Word document, we would be able to, like in Amherst, we made a new by, um, bylaw. Every time anything was updated, they made a paper copy or a Word document that we could print out that updated it every single time. And it wasn't like you had these new bylaws that are sort of out in somewhere else land. Um, so that's what Casey was talking with uh, Carleen, our interim town clerk about updating and um, paying the money for ECODE to do that. It's seeing how we could get a Word document because converting the PDF is would be a disaster. Okay, this is helpful for this piece of our potential priorities. I don't know if you had a particular an additional just, question with this, I Kathy. Had a, can move on? I had a quick question. This is Kathy Wittrobe. So is there a templated process 
for updating these bylaws. So for example, I mean, so for example, you're looking at key specific things, four key specific things. Is it relevant? Um, is it too vague? Is it too restrictive? Is it inconsistent? Like, is there a process that's streamlined that has a templated element to it? So we're not wasting time and wasting money. Like we have some scaffolding and some structure to the process. I mean, it really depends on somebody going through it. I mean, you don't, it because of the way a bylaw is actually developed over time and voted on different years and, and, it's, it's piecemeal together. So if somebody didn't check that properly or match words correctly, or, I mean, it's like, you know, when you write a will, if you use the words and, or, and it's all on interpretation of, at least with the zoning bylaw of the building commissioner, how he interprets that. So if it's not clear, and it, it's difficult. And to your question, no, there isn't a template. And because it's based on our our town's bylaw and how it was sort of put together over time. And what Ken was saying before, I have seen a few towns bylaws, and I find the numbering is so important in being able to follow and find information. And I find it a little bit challenging for Deerfields to honestly, to, to actually, yeah. Um, and, and so to really look at the numbering and to see how we could change that and make it easier for people to navigate through it and, and you know, table of contents and mm -hmm. uh, appendix and index, like all of those things I think um, uh, are really important to look at. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have a good understanding of how comprehensive that could be. Um, what's another area that- Can I ask a question first before we yes. move away from e-code? Are we, pay, do we pay for e-code? We do. So if we are not using it properly or extensively- We are, we're using it. It's just a matter of people knowing how to use it. And, and also it's, it's the incorporation of it. And I'm not sure, I don't know. I have not used e-code like, like I've not, I didn't use e-code before. So, so this is new. This is a new um, not approach. To Deerfield. It's not new. It's not new to Deerfield, but um, Carlene seems to have a good grasp on eCode, the interim clerk. And so she, I know this past week she's been talking to Casey. So I'm not 100% sure what they're um, planning on doing, but it's going to be quite expensive to um, to get the word document. Certainly. And so. And who's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just confused about this. So who pays for this? This is not a planning board specific I expense. This is a town wide because the select board would use it. The planning board would use it. The administrative offices would use it. Yeah. Probably the general fund or, so I don't know. I don't know okay. where it would, I'd have to get that answer for you on the so, answer yet, but. And so part of it is, you know, to get our money's worth, we should use it most effectively. Yes. So maybe it makes a lot of sense to make this a high priority if we, anyway, that's, that, that is what I was thinking. Well, the, it has been being used, like we send our approved, see the last couple of years have had really a lot of bylaw changes that Deerfield hasn't seen in, a, in quite a while. So that could be the reason why they're all like living, I don't know, and then Barbara left. So why they're all living and still in the new by, you know, new bylaw changes and not been incorporated. So I'm not sure where that process is and how it gets absorbed. And maybe Ken knows because he's dealt with well, it. Certainly sounds as if there needs to be some work or some, as you said, research done on the staff level to find yeah. out exactly yeah. what's involved with this. How about the pieces with, um, huh, we've talked a lot about our master plan that's 22 years old um, and is a, should be a template for us going forward and for many boards going forward and um, is also a sizable undertaking that hopefully would involve a lot of residents as well as people on boards and committees. Um, also our housing production plan, which still is a pretty good plan, but it's just, it, nothing has happened to it. Anybody have any thoughts about I think about we have those? to choose one. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, right. 
but I mean, and you know, the, I, I think the next thing, you know, just getting back to the, the zoning bylaws, I mean, if we can find out, first of all, um, what, what were you saying, a DLT grant? I don't know what the grant was. Okay, would that cover this? And who needs to write it? How much is it? If it doesn't cover it, um, you know, do they have any other ideas of where the funding can come from? And then just hire them to do it. So that would mainly be talking with Peggy about what are the specifics of getting a DLT grant yeah. and what would it cover? Right. That would be great. Okay. So then are there other, um, in relation to this list, um, other things that people would see as yeah. priorities? Well, if, you know, if, if the FERCOG can write that, if they can do that, we can get funding for that. You know, we sort of, you know, we obviously have to have a back and forth with them, but at the same time, we could be working on the different parts of the master plan. So we can look at that. There are five different parts to the master plan. Not all of them need, you know, crazy updating, but we can really look at the ones that are most important and start working on them. And I know the economic development part is very important. And I think the select board has mentioned that. I think that is. I think that sort of goes hand in hand with what we're trying to do with connecting community initiatives. So we could take a look at, you know, the five different parts of the master plan and start on that. And I know, as, as you said, Annalie, when they did it before, it was a huge community involvement. There are a lot of people on different committees. So I think we could start working on that. Well, as we talk about, we can start working on that. Um, there's a question of who the we is. I mean, you know, your CCI chair, we've got, you know. Our... Well, I, I, you know, I, th I think that first of all, we as the planning board, because I think it was the planning board's responsibility for the master plan, I think we should take a look at at least um, not, not read the entire thing, because I think we have one copy, right? <laughs> And how many pages? Oh, it's, it's no, we've got it. It's 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 um. We made a copy, right? Electronic. It's electronic. Yeah, electronic is really difficult for me to look mm -hmm. through with a zillion different pages. But do you know how many pages it is? Oh, it's you know it's yeah two inches thick. Okay, so maybe okay then each of us we have to decide each person or persons. Maybe we can have two people look at each section. Okay, and then decide, then come back together and decide, hey, and then we can prioritize which section we should start on first, and then we get committee members, we get other committee members to join in with that and just mm -hmm. do it one piece at a time. Sure. I think probably one piece at a time is the only way we can I think get you're through. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> um, how about the question of um, looking at our whole housing situation? Um, and strategizing, in fact, ways to increase our housing inventory. We do have a housing production plan that would probably be one of the first places we would start by looking. I mean, again, the question is how could we engage FERCOG to assist us with this, you know, to be with, it, with all of these things? How can we get FERCOG to help us, not just that we have more tasks to share amongst ourselves? Denise, you look like I, you, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all of these and I, I know, you know, you, she said it's going to take a couple of years. And my concern is that there are so many things on this list that we're going to dilute. You know, we're going to have so many things that we're doing that none no, of them are going to maybe get I, done. Maybe I introduced this incorrectly. I'm thinking from a priority standpoint. So what's oh, the priority. one thing? What's maybe what's one thing so that we might ask Peggy to assist oh, okay. us with to begin with? Zoning. Uh, that, that would be my vote for the housing production plan that you're talking about zoning like yeah what well, do you mean no, draft for her for the if you're looking at the second bullet draft zoning bylaw okay, changes okay. that's when something comes sure. forward that's a urgent request that um you know in the past we've had chris help us or um you know if, if it, a planner who could help write a new zoning bylaw for like uh, Kathy and I were talking today about um, needing to look again potentially at our short term rental bylaws. So we would have for COG, we would engage them to 
look at our current bylaw, yeah. make some suggestions, bring it back to us, and then we would take it to town meeting. So that's that's sort of a uh, <coughs> that, that sort of will happen mm -hmm. depending on if we have anything in particular that we have as a burning issue to ask right. about. Um, you know, and, and for example, I mean, that would tie into the fourth bullet down of looking at this question of um, what can we do to sort of revitalize our town center as we're looking at the town campus. We certainly have some concerns about the concrete and the lack of trees and the, yeah. you know, whatnot in the town center. Is there a way that we can and actually incorporate some mixed use development with some housing in there. And, um, you know, is that something that, that Peggy could assist us with, first of all, educating us with what are some possibilities that we could look at? I mean, I have a feeling that that might mean then proposing a lot of bylaws changes in, in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. um, So if I understand you right, Kathy Sylvester, you're asking us to get a priority list and start. Well, or even if just a, you know, a number, I mean, it could be that it, it might not be that we're giving as of tonight that we're giving Kathy a uh, marching order that this is what we're going to ask you to do first. You know, it could be that we'll ask her about um, how might she approach um, looking at our bylaws and then how might she approach helping us with our master plan or with upzoning town center or um you know what would be the ways that they could help us with that and then we bring I, that back i mean it's not that we have to you know i, I guess i look at the reviewing the the bylaws and the master plan is like putting the foundation for everything else sure. that's on this list yeah so mm -hmm. i feel like that's a prior those two are the priorities mm -hmm. to me and then we can build from there once we have the foundation that everything else depends on. Yep, I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, there we go. Okay, yeah. so I will talk with Peggy about how, in fact, either she or through some grant assistance, and oh, by the way, how do we get that grant assistance, <laughs> um, could help us with reviewing our bylaws and with. Um, starting to update our master plan. When we talk about reviewing the bylaws, I mean, we've got a number of bylaws that we are required, responsible for. There's chapter 179, which is all of our zoning bylaws. There's also the stormwater management. There's um, subdivision bylaws. Uh, I think right now we're primarily talking about 179. Is that correct? Zoning bylaws. Yeah, the zoning bylaws. We got started with that. Mm -hmm. Right, and we have to just make sure that the general bylaw also has, because we have the general bylaw and within that, then you have the 179. So making sure that they're. So you want it to be general bylaws also. What do you think, Ken? <laughs> I'm not a planner. I'm just saying that there's, you know, we don't want it to conflict. Well, I, I think what what you're alluding to is basically that what Jen is alluding to is within the contents of e-code, there's a specific enumeration and ensuring that whatever that enumeration looks like, that the planning board zoning bylaw also uses that enumeration. Obviously, they're going to be different headings. It's going to be look a little different, but it's knowing that chapter 179 is the planning board's zoning bylaw. You're going to have 179-1. That's your introduction. That's your purpose, right? 179.2. That's the definitions, let's say, depending on, uh, depending on how um, you, you have your bylaw. But it's it's ensuring that the enumeration follows what e-code looks like. Um, because currently, it's listed as four digit numbers, right? 5,400 for the site plan review section. So maybe presumably that would be 179-13, let's say, um, depending on, you know, that enumeration once, there's, there, there's just gonna have to be a lot of coordination, I think, to ensure that whatever your final zoning bylaw looks like and whatever process that you go through, that um, it, you know, is coordinated with the, the town's effort to update. Okay, the, so that would just be a question to have 
that you opine on also. Jen? Jen, I have a question for you. If you know of a town's bylaw that you really like and the formatting of it that just really flows and is easy, that we could use as an example to look at just so people can understand the differences between, you know, Deerfields and, I mean, anybody can stop and I have Amherst bylaw on my desk that's old now, very, very old, but you can sort of see the way, I mean, I was just used to using it, but if there was some other bylaw that you know of that would be um, an Talking example. about general bylaw or zoning bylaw? Well, zoning bylaw, if that's what the board would be interested in. Um, I, I would, I mean, I, when I do my reviews, I, obviously play within the context of what they're currently using. So for instance, okay. All right. yeah, so Pelham has, is, is, has e-code, they know their chapter 125. So all of the amendments that I'm trying to suggest they do is like 125-1 is, you know, your purpose. And then you have up to 10, but within one, two, three, four, five, there's like 1.1 or 1.1a or whatever. You write, you get yeah. spaces for adding, right? And exactly. So you have making it. Uh, uh, yeah, you have a predictable numbering scheme when it comes time to amend. Okay, so I'll ask, uh, have a conversation with Peggy kind of in two places. One is, how might they be able to assist us with starting to update our master plan section by section, most likely? And secondly, how might they be able to assist us with um, writing, obtaining grant assistance, grant support to um, review certainly our chapter 179 bylaws and potentially the general town bylaws also for inconsistencies and whatnot. Is that what we're talking about yes. now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right okay. No, then. It's an ongoing conversation, but <laughs> as as I just had my house painted, you know, it, it's harder to prep than it is to actually do the work. <laughs> so true. so, so true. I think we're doing the prep right now. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. All right. Thank you all very much. Good. Um, accessory apartments update. Uh, Kathy. Um, so we haven't made a lot of changes or progress. I, I had a meeting, Rachel and I, with Peggy Sloan. Uh, from FERCOG as she's now got some time to give the planning board. So we wanted to get her input and she read through our uh, draft. Um, and I'm going to now meet with Chris to make some more changes and so forth after getting her input. There's a couple of questions that I wanted to bring to the board to get your opinion on. Hope I can explain this because I'm diving into the middle of something that's probably it's foremost in my mind and probably not yours. So, um, if you remember, well, if you go to the current bylaw, there is um, definition of what so the size can be. Okay. Currently, it just says um, the maximum gross floor area of the accessory apartment shall not exceed 30% of the gross floor area of the dwelling or 1,200 square feet maximum, whichever is lesser size. In no event, however, will the apartment be required to be smaller than 800 square feet. That's what is in our current law. So there's a lot of batting around about, you know, is it, should it be half the size, but no more than 900 square feet. Some people felt that was a little too small and wanted to go to 1200 square feet. And uh, so there's all this discussion. So what I have found out is it'd be wise for us to know the temperature in the town for passing this bylaw at all, because <laughs> if we want to pass by simple majority, the language has to be very specific. Um, and that language, according to um, Peggy, you found this information, some zoning ordinances and bylaws from the state. Let's say we want to allow someone up to 1200 square feet, we would have to get two thirds majority of town meeting. 
if we wanted to get just a simple majority, it would have to read um, the statutory definition limits the size of the unit to no larger in floor area than half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is smaller. So you could have a 15, 1400 square foot house, could not build anything larger than 700 square feet. And if we went with that language. And that's limiting. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. too small. So um, if we want to be more expansive, we have to be ready to, uh, or be prepared to pray for two thirds. Work for, <laughs> work for. <laughs> if we really feel it's gonna be a razor thin margin and we want this to pass, we should go with this more restrictive language. So I just wanted to get some feedback from what people. Kathy? Did you? Oh, oh no, yeah. you were just. No, no, just no, I just wanted to go. Gesture. So this, uh, well, I, I have some. Denise, I have some questions. Okay, so first of all, it's okay. First thing we've talked about before is that to do an accessory apartment to add on, first of all, you have to have, if, if you're on septic, you have to. It, yeah. It's going to be very difficult. But we're to not do. talking about septic and sewer right now. Well, I know, but that has a big that has a big bearing on this bylaw because to do that, it would be so restrictive. I mean, it would be really difficult for a lot of people to do. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think a lot of this would happen within town mm -hmm. with the sewer because it would be more affordable. Okay. Sure. So if you look at that, then secondly, um, oh gosh. I sort of lost size. the second part. <laughs> yeah, the, the size. I mean, seven hundred square feet is really small. So yeah. I mean, I would I would opt for, I'd say nine hundred. So at least eight hundred. Well, let's just say, if we're going to go for the two thirds majority, and we can go with any way we want. I yeah. mean, the, the the feeling of the subcommittee. Um, some members were fine with nine hundred, and some said, you know, I really think we should say the max that it should be no larger than twelve hundred square. Feet. In other mm -hmm. words, you could have a 3,000 square foot house. Mm -hmm. Your ADU cannot be more than 1,200 square feet. That seems okay. reasonable um, in comparison to the size of the main house. So there was a, you know, there's, there was debate. Mm -hmm. And I right. would say, since Rachel's not here, I'll tell you what she said. And she said, I'm more of an incrementalist and I would stick with the language of um, half the square footage of the primary residence or 900 square feet, whichever, but in no case, I, I think what she would all, what we also said, no case would be required to be less than 900 mm -hmm. square But we're not sure if, according to Peggy's, that that would be that would acceptable. Not work. That, that would, not, that work. would not, work. not work. Right, that would not work. I mean, we could say that, we could mm -hmm. say, you know. We still would need two thirds. It would be mm -hmm. half the square footage of your house or 900 square mm -hmm. feet. In no case would we require it to be less than 900, or we could say half the square footage of your house or 1200 square feet mm -hmm. maximum, um, you know, something like that. So can I just add a little question? Sure. So the statutory definition is by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right. Housing and Economic Development. So this is the statutory de definition of State in the state, it's not a yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't clarify that, wrong. but that, that's why if we want it to pass, we have yes. to follow that. So we, we do have to follow mm -hmm. that because it's beyond it's beyond us. If we beyond want to pass limits. with simple majority, yeah, and it's also beyond local limits. It's a, it's a right. larger um, body that's governing what can be presented and how that's voted on. Okay, so we can present others, but we just sure. have to get the two thirds. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I had another question, and I don't recall. Is, does there have to be a certain firewall in between? So if it's if it's part of the house, I don't know. Probably building code. Yeah, you know, okay, that. so that's yeah. yeah, that's where the building. And it can be detached, detached also. Uh, and, and detached is also okay. With this. It is part of building code <clears throat> for having separation. Yeah. There's also requirements. Let's say if you have a garage and you want an apartment above a garage. 
Right. So, but that's all building code. Um, something I didn't, um, I didn't know if your group had, because I haven't been at your meetings, um, if they've addressed is if in our um, zoning bylaw, if it states, you know, how big of a lot you have and then if you add another dwelling unit to the lot that you know that's something that would need to adjust if you were having larger units versus smaller units you need so much square footage of your lot i just don't know if if that's um been looked are you at talking about setbacks or are you talking about not setback percentage area of the lot that can be built on correct is that what that is yeah that that too but there's yeah, I don't know that. So the only thing that I think we've mentioned is that we still have to comply with setbacks mm -hmm. and right. um, that there can only be one accessory apartment per lot. But if it fills up the whole lot within the setbacks. Well, there's a percentage that you can, that oh, you well, can build. Well, we're complying with the rest of the right. building codes. So building still codes, to, right. Still have to. No, you're right. The other. Right. Right. So, I mean, if you're having a 1500 square foot accessory apartment because you have a three, you know, 3000 square foot house and that it, you know, that you have enough land and setback so it doesn't look like you're crowding in, you know, it all depends on the area. And if you're part of septic, it just, that seems large to me yeah. in, um, all of that's a good point. I mean, pretty sure we can we can check, but I think right now there is some clause in there somewhere that says we have to comply with the rest of the no, dimensional no. requirements. Yeah, yeah. Is there a point where it's finite? Like it's Kathy, finite. yeah, Kathy Wittrobo. Kathy Wittrobo. I mean, is there a point where it's finite, right? So people could have various size houses, which might indicate half that size for an accessory dwelling, but is there a point where it's finite? It cannot be more than. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. So that's well, why, that's that why we talked our, about, what, like that becomes our point. We, we can write whatever we okay. want, okay. you know, and that it was either 900 or 1200, okay. well, it's batted around nothing larger. Than but that finite thing. piece is not part of the state statute. Right. So yes. if we wanted to do a maximum size, then we would be at the two thirds majority. Gotcha. Passing. And Andrea, yes. Um, I'm Peggy. I assume knows what's going on in other nearby towns. I have certain things passed more readily than others, and um, are the towns more like Deerfield? I, I'm just trying to figure out instead of it completely inventing, you know, reinventing the wheel I has. Has a town gotten it right and it's working? Okay. Well, I believe they're almost all 900 maximum or 900 square feet. I don't remember how that's mentioned. Kathy's checking that now. It, and um, in these other towns, there have been one or two or three units a year. Yeah, yeah and 900 is the, the average, I would, or, you know, the most common number. Again, so something else is that you could also have different types of, of um, dwelling units. So you could have one that goes from, you don't have to have just this and nothing. You can have, you can have a supplemental, you know, a um, dwelling unit that's attached, that's small, that only uh, needs building commissioner. If it's larger than it needs, that's separated, then it needs a special permit. And I mean, there can be different categories. Um, we, have that. Yeah, we do have that. I mean, right. Basically, if it takes up more than than the footprint of the existing home, it's going to need a special permit the way it's written in the draft. If it's bigger than the footprint? Yes. Or if it's detached either. Whereas if you say... Um, wouldn't that be a two family then or not depends on how you build it so you know it has to have the look of a one family home you could have an entrance on the side or in the back it, it has to be in keeping with the appearance of a one family which is what makes it different than a two family so you can enlarge your home you know by making putting on an ADU that's attached it's going to be a bigger footprint it's going to need a special permit 
or you could have an ADU that's detached, same thing, it's gonna need a special permit. Or you could re-outfit your house the way it is by making, I have a split level, I could make the downstairs into a separate mm -hmm. independent unit and that would not need a special permit. Mm -hmm. So that's by right. Right. One of the things that Kathy and I have discussed, which is larger than the scope of the conversation right now, but when we're thinking of, do we feel like we want to go with this 50%, you know, simple majority versus the two thirds is That's um, the question here. Yeah, <laughs> right. Is also to sort of how controversial might the other sections of the bylaw mm -hmm. be. So as Denise was talking about septic versus sewer. We're saying septic, there's still a little question about that, that septic would need to have it authorization. To have it has to have Board of Health approval. Board of Health approval. Yeah. Um, versus special permit. And I'm still trying to clarify that because I don't think it needs a special permit unless it meets the other conditions requiring a special permit, such as a detached building, which would need by itself a special permit, regardless of where you built it. Mm -hmm. Just to, one of the things that the state is pushing towns to do is to allow a lot more of this by right, actually. So um, that's the trend. I mean, they want to increase housing. Right. Denise, it doesn't make sense to do it, you know, to do just the, the first one, what is it, the by, not the by right, but the 900 square feet, pass that, see how that goes, and then we can always amend it, you know, sure. maybe a couple of years from that, mm -hmm. when people sort of get used to the idea. Does that make sense? So to that do? would be a half of the square footage of the existing residence or 900 square feet, mm -hmm. whichever is smaller. That's what it would be. So that would mean that mm -hmm. with a 1500 square foot house, house pretty small. you could only have a 700 maximum. ADU because it's written, yeah, that it can be 50% of your primary dwelling or 900, whichever is smaller. Hmm. So you'd have to have an, at least an 1800 square foot house for it to be 900. Right. Yeah. Right. And when you're taking that square footage, you're not including a garage, you're not including the basement, you're only including, okay. okay. Living area. So I you could build an ADU with a garage and a and you know, an attic, and that's not going to be included. Huh. It's living space. Well, okay, so so that may be a question. Maybe the building inspector has an answer to this. I mean, because I guess realistically, I, thought, I think most of this would probably happen within South Deerfield. Okay, mm -hmm. that's on that's on um, sewer. Yeah. And so, what are the smallest homes here? I don't know. I have no idea what the square footage. I mean, are they, are a lot of them 1,500 square feet or are, they, are most of them a little larger than that? So it wouldn't even be an Mine's issue. Mine's 1,200. Yours is 1,200? The whole is 1,200 square feet. That's, That's what they said. said. It seems yeah. like it's bigger than that. But because they're not going to take, they're not going to take. Excuse me, you think yours is 1,200? Yeah, I think the houses on my street are relatively around that. And that's not including my basement. I have, a big, I have a pretty large basement. Wow. So, I mean, you'd be surprised, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. when you start looking at square footage and how much space there is, and then... That's how you use the space, too. Yeah. I mean, oh, another it's... thing that might be helpful, if we went for the two-thirds majority, we might want to keep the, the maximum at 900, mm -hmm. sort of a middle ground. I mean, mm -hmm. we're still going for the two-thirds majority, oh. but... We're yeah. not going for the 1200, which yeah. might be scary. Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. Hmm. That could be in some sections of South Deerfield, mm -hmm. another house. house. Yeah, it could be quite <laughs> big. Yeah. <laughs> what we're really looking at is accessory, like mm -hmm. an add on. Yeah. For, you know, a variety That's an of interesting reasons. idea to bring back to the group. Yeah. So I don't know if we're going to have another subcommittee group oh, or not, yeah. but I'm going to, you know, it's really discussion between us tonight mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and then have Chris write it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you guys have the last word, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and we may, um, I did see that the um, special town meeting is, has been set for October 24th, 7 p.m. Everybody yep. put that down in your calendars. 
So um, recognizing that we would need to have public hearing. I can't remember. We have one public hearing or two when we're doing a bylaws um, proposal. Yeah. Just one, just yeah. one. Okay. So it would mean that we would need to have our public, well, we could have extra planning board meetings. Um, we could have the have so it. You want, you want to have this ready for special town meeting and not just wait for annual town meeting? Well, that's what we're debating about. That's what we're debating. If we wanted to try to have it for the special town meeting, we'd have to probably have an additional. Yeah, I'd also talk to Casey about. Board meeting. Excuse me, Jen? Um, speak with Casey about what else is on that special town well, meeting. Well, she said that we could put oh, okay. papers in, so. You know, an another question, because, uh, you know, I already know from past meetings that there will be pushback from certain individuals. Okay, we all know that. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess the question is, what kind of information can we get out to the public about this prior to the meeting that would be helpful to help educate people to help push that through? That's what I would be more inclined to hold off until spring instead yeah. of trying to rush it yeah. to, and then have a failed attempt and have people, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Mary? That would be my suggestion. I want to second what Denise says because on social media, we are often perceived uh -huh. to be pushing things through on special town meetings when we're just trying to get business done. So I think that if we waited, that, you know, optics problem wouldn't be there. Well, if I we could have, like have some informational oh, right. material yeah. that could be distributed would be very helpful. And if we had some of that informational material, we could distribute that at the special town meeting. We could have, we could talk to the reporter, Chris Larrabee has been doing a terrific job, talk to the reporter, have him come to one of the meetings and he can put a good piece in the paper and a lot of people here read the reporter. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what I would I think also suggest. this is a this is to some degree a Kathy, pocketbook. Yes. I'm sorry, Kathy with trouble. I think this is also to some degree like a, a pocketbook issue, right? A financial issue for many people that they want to not only develop more housing in the town, but they want to stay in their own home. They want to cut the costs of that. They want to you know separate living space, and it may actually be something um, at the annual town meeting that will bring more people out to vote. It'll be bring more people to mm -hmm. the meeting. I mean, I don't think there's heavily <laughs> attended. And so we're passing some big ticket items with very few people and we need to get as many people yeah. to these meetings to vote as possible. Um, yes, Jen? Have you, um, has the committee thought of maybe sending out a questionnaire to the community mm -hmm. about what their, you know, wants? Just, no. <laughs> You know, we got, just, I mean, we got we quite answer. a bit of, <laughs> have not thought about that. Well, That's a great uh, idea. Just because then it's, we're being more like we're asking people for input and then, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we did have the subcommittee that at least included members of finance committee, zoning board. You know, oh, I think that that's wonderful. I'm just sort of seeing. No, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I could be doing this project for the next three years. It's my worry. <laughs> and, um, you know, and you know, you've already added like, you know, you've got some information and <laughs> I'm just like, ah. But so, it's, you'll so always get the people that say, I didn't know, even though we've talked about this at every oh, meeting sure. and, you know, it's, um, yeah. it's just putting it out on Facebook, putting it out on our website, having the flyers. I mean, you know, from CCI and, um, you know, senior housing and all, all of it, that it's um, just getting it out there as much as possible. So we have people on board to, to know what's being right. talked about, even though we've talked about it. No, I mean, one of the worries but, I have about sending out an informational questionnaire is that no one's going to answer it, just well, like with the senior housing. Yeah, really they just need out. How well, then we can't say we didn't try. I know. But how many times have I gotten text messages about that senior housing thing, which I sent in a long time yeah. ago? Because no, you know, they're not getting enough but, response. Uh, Kathy, yes. I, I was going to suggest, you know, if we had a five question questionnaire, hang out at the dump. What do you think about these five things? Answer them for, you know, we just walk with people as they dump their trash. We could get some, we could get some data gathered. Are we allowed to do that these yes, days? Yes, you okay. can. Okay. 
Well, it's about together, but... I mean, as, as we look at this, at the components of the, um, of the bylaw, we, it, it might be hard figuring out the five top points, <laughs> but yeah. The other thing about the October special meeting is I'm going to be gone most of October, so I will be just coming back, and mm -hmm. so I won't be able to do anything mm -hmm. about this right before the meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Yes, Denise, Thank sorry. You. No, that's okay. You know, I think with anything, it's it's never just one thing that you do. It's multiple things that you do. So I, I'm, I still think it would be a really good idea to come up. You don't have to come up with, you know, confusing if it's this, it's this, you know, just come up with the idea that we're working on accessory dwelling. The reason why is because you may have an in-law, you may have an in-law, you may have, you know, who knows, you may want to rent it out to a UMass grad student, you may want to have some extra income, whatever the things, whatever people may want to do, put that on a piece of paper so we can send it out to whoever does show up for the special town meeting. We can put that on Facebook. You can mm -hmm. put that wherever. And by that time, you just keep doing it, keep repeating it, put, you know, have it at the dump. And by the time our regular town meeting comes, somebody's got to know what's going on. <laughs> so we would do it without a mailing, which is going to cost Forget money. the mailing. Or that no, costs no, no. too much money, I would yeah. think. No, yeah. not, not a mailing, in person. But at the special town meeting at the dump and the Yeah, Facebook I mean, multiple, sure. multiple places. Sure. And put it on Facebook. Put it on Deerfield right. now, as Ann Mary says. You know, there are the naysayers on Deerfield now, but there's also some really good information on there, too. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, I mean, something else that, that I've permitted in the past was um, somebody who wanted to stay on their property. And so their caregiver actually lived in the primary dwelling and the person that was elderly built a single family that was on the property and the caregiver could then, you know, so it was like they were living in the accessory, this, right. this person that permitted, you know, and it was, it just, it's, it's thinking sort of outside the box for people. I had never heard that. I'm like, oh, so you're not going to live in your main house. You're going to build another building and smaller and you're going to move in there and you care, you know, but it makes so much sense. Like you feel like you're on your same property. You're not um, going into assisted living, but you have, you, you have a rental property with somebody that is caring for you as well. And I thought that that was pretty, it was a neat way to yeah. Look at it. Oh, I have one more thing, though. I do have to tell you one more question about this. Uh, not to spend too much time here, but <laughs> um, this is a little complicated. And uh, but we spent a lot of time talking about the primary residence or the ADU. It uh, doesn't matter who the the owner in whichever piece of the property they live in. That they need it needs to be owner occupied except for bona fide absences. Then we got into discussing what does that mean, and then it got into well, how long is that? And then it was well, six months. Okay, six months. Like, no. and they take two months here no. and there. Uh, then it was six months per calendar year, so you could actually be gone a year. And then it was well, what about the person with a single family home? They don't have any limits on how long they can rent their house for, right? They don't. You can rent your house for five years. So, and who would who would be? Um, this is Andrea. Who Andrea, would be? Please. Just a moment, please, Andrea. Sorry. So, what the subcommittee threw out there was try to be fair to everyone. So you have an ADU, and uh, you had it built for whatever reason. Doesn't matter. You sold the place. Somebody else bought it. You know they live there for 10 years and they rent out the ADU and then they want to go to that, like that couple that came to us that went to Alaska. They want to leave half of it empty so they can come and go. Mm -hmm. They might not come for a year, mm -hmm. but they want to come and go. Well, as long as we, if we change that language, instead of saying, you know, has to be owner occupied, except for bona fide absences, take that out and mm -hmm. just say only one unit can be rented then you kind of get out of the whole mess, right? Yes. Um, and so that's the suggestion. So I just want to bring that to get your mm -hmm. opinion. So that person could leave. I mean, they could leave half their house empty if they want to. I don't think anybody wants to do that for too long, but. Andrea, you had a question and then Denise? Uh, who would regulate that, the coming and the well, going? I mean, that's the this, problem. 
as any of this, none of it is going to be policed. It's going to be by complaint. And it doesn't matter how you write it, no one's going to regulate it or police it. It's going to be by complaint driven only, mm -hmm. regardless of how we write that. I think the excuse me, Kathy with trouble. I think the probability though, if somebody has an accessory dwelling unit and one person has to be living there, they're not going to let loose their house on people that are going to damage it. I mean, there there will be owner responsibility, I think, for that space. You know, the owner still is responsible for Correct. that place. And I and I so I think taking out the language is a great idea. I don't, I think the probability of it being problematic is less likely because the owner of the property is not going to have somebody in there that's responsible unless they're, you know, airbnb it and people are in and out, in and out, in and out. I don't, I don't think that's what it is. So I think the probability would just, it would be less um, problematic to a neighborhood than, you know. So it's not going to become a two family, in other words, right. because you can't rent both units. Right. And we also have some language that, you know, you can't do short term rentals. In these. Right. Right. Denise. No, that's fine. I mean, I was with Andrew about the enforcement, which I think is ridiculous and that's never going to happen. Right. But, yeah. you know, I agree. I think, you know, just renting one of the units sounds yeah. good to me. Okay. I think that sounds reasonable. And I think Anna Mary oh. had a question. Yeah, Mary, you had a question? Yeah, I just want to be aware of like not making a backdoor sort of bylaw. Like if we want to make a bylaw about like, you know, two family unit rentals where one of them's empty, then we should do that. And if we want to make an accessory unit one, we should do that. And I, I want to avoid accidentally creating bylaws because they're loopholes. So I want to just, you know, make be pause here and think carefully about that. Can you if you say, well, you don't have to live there um, and it's by complaint only. Well, I, I don't know. I, it seems like some people could get away with it. And so I don't know. I, I think we might want to think carefully about what we're creating. But isn't that also, as Kathy was saying, what we could do with our own individual houses now? Okay. My house. I mean, that's the question is. In either way you write this, somebody could take advantage and and break the bylaw and who would know unless it was complaint driven. Um, well, I just wanna make sure that if we're making a, a bylaw that says that you can have two rental units and you don't have to live there, that that's what it says. And yeah. it's not an accessory dwelling unit that turned into, well, technically we can do this because it says that. Um, so that's that's my concern or make a bylaw that makes it legal. Like I, I don't have a personal stake in it. I just want to use accurate language. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm still not sure I get it. So I by think... default, we don't create something else. So, cause it's only a one unit can be rented is what it says. So you're just, I, are you saying that you can foresee maybe someone would rent both anyway and then. Right. And I think that if, I mean, do is, is it legal to do that? Is there a way for people to own a property and have two rental units in it and rent both of them out in a residential neighborhood right now? No. Well, then that would be something that somebody might be tempted to do if they needed to pay their bills. So all I'm saying is like, if we're gonna make an accessory um, dwelling bylaw um, that sort of has this, unless anybody complains about it, loophole, then maybe we should also, maybe not within this, but think about making a bylaw so that that's legal if that's if that's what we foresee happening. You know what I mean? I just wanna make a path for people to do what they want to do with their property in a legal way that isn't a loophole of some other bylaw. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I, 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 I'm I sorry, I really just can't follow this. For no, no, some no, reason, no, I'm no, just, no, just no, not no. getting into my head. Yeah. Um, and so there's two families, they're different than ADUs in, in a few different ways in bylaw, in the bylaws. So we're talking about a single family home with an ADU. We're not talking about a two family home. Right. So that language needs to be clear. I think it's that piece right there. So what we're discussing is a single family home with an ADU attached or not attached, right? Right. Or not attached. And 
So that language is clear. It's not a two care. Single family with an ADU. And the ADU, its size requirement, and the ability, are we removing the language of has to be only occupied all the time? I mean, this is where we're getting mucky. You know what I mean? Right. I think we're, we're um, instead of saying how long the owner can be gone, right. we're simply saying you must account for one part of it, one, one or the other. Um, you can dwelling. only rent one part. You can only rent one, one of the dwellings. The other part, exactly. the other dwelling is yours. Now, I don't think anybody's going to. I think as long as we say you can only rent <laughs> one of the two. The right. primary residence or the ADU, you right. cannot rent them both at the, at the same time. And I think there maybe should be some onus of property management on the owner of the, right? Like, well, but you then do we, we don't have fireworks and having a party and have it six dogs. And do we have that for any single family home that um, someone rents? We don't, right? Yeah. So I, I don't want to start making. Yeah. We probably, I mean, this is indicative, first of all, that this ain't going to happen for October 24th. No, <laughs> that's, true. No, right. no. that's for sure. Um, and it's 10 of 9, and we have Thank a couple of yeah. exactly things what I that to we say. need to move <laughs> forward with. We could um, discuss this next well, meeting. That's yeah, right. Well, on that. I think also, yeah. too, um, yeah. Chris, Chris uh, Curtis has been working on this since last right. year. Um, he had some additional monies that were not spent from the last contract period that were brought forward to this fiscal year, uh, four hundred fifty dollars. Four ninety five. Four ninety five is it? Yes. Oh, okay, but um, but the contract expired last June thirtieth, so um, we are looking to renew his contract um to continue work on this bylaw to the um limit at least at this point of 495 and if we need more then we would have to come back to the planning board for um a new contract and a new so is that so kathy you want to make a motion <laughs> about the contract mm -hmm. yeah i make a motion that we extend chris curtis's contract for the purpose of Finishing our ADU bylaws, not to exceed the cost of $495. Nice. Can I second that? That was Denise. Uh, so, Kathy Wachoba. Kathy Wachoba, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Absolutely, Kathy Sylvester. I need help. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, Denise. Denise Mason, yes. Andrea? Andrea Leibson, yes. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, yes. And Annalie Wolf Cool, yes. So thank you. To be continued. Um, and we do have one note under um, other business not recently anticipated. Uh, Denise? Yes. Um, let's see. OK. We have um, just going back to Snowberry Court, which will eventually in town, which oh. everyone, everyone's aware of, which will eventually be turned over to the HOA and um, what we want to, I think we will be higher and the town will be higher in a peer review to peer review the engineer who happened to be Tony tonight, oh. okay? And so, and the reason why we're doing that is to provide more information, you know, just to put the home homeowners at ease and, um, you know, to address their concerns. Okay, so we want to do that. Um, we've, and, you know, just talking to Casey, in the meantime, since Snowberry started, we've had four different building inspectors. Wow. It's been very confusing. We've got a whole new planning board. The only person who was still on the planning board is Rachel, she's not here tonight. Um, and we also have three, new three town. town administrators sort of interim. So, I mean, it's been a very confusing time. Yeah. So we felt that this is, what we should be doing. And I talked to Casey, I think she talked to the um, 
to the engineer and it would be approximately five hours to review, two hours for meeting and hundred dollars. So it'd be approximately seven to nine hundred dollars to do this that the planning board would pay for. And I did check with Barbara, thank you, Annalie. And in our account, we've got $12,820. So I think that we can do that. I think we should do that. And hopefully we will move things through, make everyone happy and put it to bed. Yeah. Okay. Do you wanna make a motion? So I would make a motion to pay for the engineer for the peer review for Snowberry Court to be approximate, I don't know the exact approximate, seven to $900. I second that. Kathy Wittroba. Kathy Wittroba. Discussion? Discussion, yes. Andrea? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm wondering why the planning board is paying for it and not the company that built Snowbeard. That is, that is a very long answer, Andrea. Um, that is because the prior planning board did not make a request to do that and put in a bond. And at this time, it would stir the pot and not be good. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a short answer to a long answer. Um, yeah. And as a reminder for the, during the discussion, um, since I'm in a butter to in a butter, I will abstain. Yeah. So, can we say um, just... I think you did say it, but just to reiterate, because Casey was saying seven hundred to a thousand dollars, just to or as to, you know at least have that buffer. That's fine. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, so and I and I said approximately too. So. Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. All right. Um, let me call the question, Kathy Wachowski. Kathy Wachowski, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Andrea? Andrea Liebson, yes. And Anne Mary? And Mary Cluder, yes. And Who seconded it? I'm sorry. Who seconded Who's, it? Denise made the motion. I seconded Kathy, Kathy. Wachowski. Thank you. Anne Mary was yes, and I abstained. So it passes. <laughs> Public comments. Um, are there any? No. Still hanging around? It doesn't appear to. <clears throat> um, reports, committees. Seminars, discussions. I can do a very quick report. Um, I'm CCI Connecting Community Initiative. We're, well, we have a meeting Wednesday night. So who's ever on the committee, I hope you'll be there. Um, we've, been, we've been working on, we've been uh, talking to various legislators. We've talked with uh, uh, Jim McGovern a number of times. We've done a presentation. He's, you know, the last time we talked to him, he said, you know, a lot of people ask for money, but they don't have a plan. He said, you guys have a plan and he'd like to continue meeting with us. And we are talking, you know, we asked him, hopefully he put in, I guess next time, a $3 million bond. I don't know whether, you know, uh, or earmark. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But um, so we, we have been very busy working on that and working with the town on, uh, you know, figuring out the, the various buildings and what we're doing. So, you know, we'll keep you posted. If anyone has any more specific questions, you can just ask me or join the meeting, join the CCI meeting, it's open to everybody. Um, but there is definitely a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of movement in town, which is really good. Of course, we need a lot of money. So we're working on that. Other committees? Uh, Andrea. Open space and recreation committee meets tomorrow, 4.30. Good, keep plugging away at that condensed report. <laughs> I'll mention too that um, I've, been ha I've had a number of conversations with Pete Law, the chair of the Conservation Commission. And actually we had a uh, conference call with Peggy Sloan asking how might the planning board and the Conservation Commission work a little bit more closely together. And her main um, suggestion was that, in fact, we keep talking to each other and then also pull into that loop um, the ZBA and that members of the various committees should attend other meetings or listen to the reports as, or the meeting Zooms as um, or YouTube or whatever it is um, as possible. So um, thank you for those of you who are um, I'll let you know when some of these other meetings are going on and yeah. if you can. Can, can I just, can I just add I mean, to that yes, just briefly? Please. That's, that's part of the reason for connecting community initiative. And I ask people every single time because there are representatives who represent every single board and committee in town. 
And so I say, please go back. I don't care whether you're a committee chair or just a member, please go back and tell people what what's going on, what's transpired in the meeting or invite them to the meeting. They can always look online. So that's also a means of educating people so that you don't have to attend every single meeting, which is really difficult. I mean, oftentimes I see Anna Lee on the meeting or I'm on the select board meeting, but not everyone is able to do that. So, you know, have conversations and communicate with people. And that's really important to try and be as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, our mail, uh, Ember Gardens, and I'm really appreciating having these monthly written updates. They're just exactly what they need to be. They're concise and they're small. And basically Eversource has finished their due diligence of the property and still waiting for a conservation or a conservation. Uh, the Cannabis Control Commission to review the application. Um, I think there was an article in the uh, recorder a couple weeks ago talking about how uh, the Cannabis Control Commission has just a huge backlog. And I, you know, whether or not what the causes of that is, I'm not sure, but, but um, approvals of um, these marijuana establishments um, are just so slow everywhere. Mm -hmm. Shelburne Falls had a um, ZBA public hearing, a special permit to construct a warehouse and storage facility. And then also Green Greenfield had a special permit um, that was granted for construction of a 900 square foot detached accessory apartment mm -hmm. with the condition that new lighting be shielded and downcast. Mm -hmm. So good. there we go. Okay, our next meeting is September 12th. And if there's no other discussion, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Oh, yeah. uh, Kathy, Kathy Sylvester. <laughs> and it looks like Kathy Wittrobo was just there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I second that motion. All <laughs> right. Any discussion? All right. Any Hi. Yes. Mary. Yes. Denise. Yes. Yes. Yes, Kathy. Yes. All right. Thank you all very much and see you uh, September 12th. See you in September. See you.